So now we're going to walk through just a couple examples of calculating the population size, the sample error rates, and the upper deviation rates. So the auditor has decided to test a control at Collabro Wireless Services. The test is to determine that sales and contracts are properly authorized. So the desired confidence level is 95%, tolerable deviation rate 6, expected is 1, and sample size is 78. First thing you are typically asked to do in these is figure out the sample size. To figure out the sample size, you actually have these sample size tables. And there are two tables. One is for 95% confidence level. One is for 90% confidence level. Remember 90 versus 95, it's going to be given to you in the question. So just make sure you're always using the right table. So once you figure out if you're using the 90 or 95% table, then you go and you match up your tolerable deviation rate, which again is going to be given to you in some form, and your expected deviation rate, which is going to be given to you in some form. So I have my tolerable, I have my expected, and I match them up to come to my sample size, which in this case is 78. And the next thing that you do in these is first you calculate the sample deviation rate. Okay, and remember the sample deviation rate is very simple. It is number of deviations over sample size. That is going to get you that 2.6%. Then you have the computed upper deviation rate, right? So how do you get that? And we said on the prior slide, remember, we said that represents this, the sample deviation rate plus an allowance for sampling risk. So that is also going to come from a table. And again, there is going to be a 95% table and a 90% table. Always make sure you're using the right one. And they'll have sample size down the left-hand side and number of deviations across the top here. Okay, so in this case, we know we had two deviations and we know our sample size is 78, right? So I know I'm in this column here with the two, but I don't see 78 down here, right? And so how do I know if I go 75 or if I go 80, right? Do I just round? If I just round, I would go 80, but that's not what this slide is doing. This slide is saying I should go 75. So basically the rule is here is always round down. And the reason why you always round down is because rounding down results in the most conservative upper deviation rate here. If I rounded up to 80, I would get a lower number here. And remember, this number that you're finding in this table represents your upper deviation rate, which I told you represents your quote unquote, worst case scenario, right? So this is the ultimate conservative estimate. So for my ultimate conservative estimate of the possible worst case error rate, it does not make sense for me to round up to get to a smaller number, right? I want to be conservative, want to round down and get the bigger number. Right? So I get my 8.2. And that's where this is coming from. Now that will be compared back to your tolerable deviation rate of 6%, which again, this was given at the beginning of the problem. And in order to figure out if you can rely upon this control or not, you compare your computed upper deviation rate, which was 8.2, to your tolerable deviation rate, just like we talked about on the slide, right? 
And we see because the computed upper deviation rate is bigger than tolerable, right? In other words, our worst case scenario for this control is more than what we can tolerate. We are not happy and we basically say, okay, the results of this test say I should not rely upon this control. All right, so now we just have a quick slide on non-statistical sampling which is interesting because we spend all this time talking about statistical sampling for test of controls when, in fact, I so rarely in practice <clears throat> ever did statistical sampling for test of controls. It was all non-statistical. So you'll see firms for purposes of consistency ac across audits might establish a non-statistical sampling policy like this. So if they want a moderate level of reliance on the control, they'll go for this sample size. If they want a high level of reliance, I'll try to go for 40 to 60. Now in coming up with these sample sizes, and people just know, hey, I'm supposed to test 25. Hey, I'm supposed to test 40. But what actually underlies these non-statistical sample sizes is statistical sampling theory. They are making assumptions about, hey, this is the confidence level you'd want, like 90% tolerable deviation rate, and they usually assume you'd find zero errors. So they are using statistical principles and assumptions to come up with these sample sizes. And again, the purpose of this is work papers are gonna look extremely consistent across the board because you go look in the audit and you're gonna see all these tests of controls using sample sizes of 25. And you can also, like I was saying, we use random sampling or random selection, which we know computer generally has to help you out with that, or systematic selection, but you can also use haphazard sampling or selection. It kind of defines haphazard here, but it's you're picking items without using any bias or judgment, but it's not truly random, right? Because a, because a computer isn't helping you to be truly random, every item must have a truly equal chance of being selected, right? But haphazard can be essentially me flipping through a phone book, right? And every few pages I stop and just point to an item, right? It's me scrolling through the spreadsheet and every few scrolls I stop and point to an item. That is haphazard. So I'm not using any bias, not using any judgment, not using my brain. I'm just picking items. When you do non-statistical sampling, the issue with that or the disadvantage to that is you cannot quantify sampling risk. And when you cannot quantify sampling risk, you also cannot mathematically quantify the computed upper deviation rate. So that's the big disadvantage there. Whereas with statistical sampling, you can quantify sampling risk, you can quantify mathematically that upper deviation rate, and so then you can compare it to your tolerable. All you can really do with non-statistical is you can compare you know, the error rate you find to your expected or historical. And Usually your expected always has to be zero errors. So if you basically, if you find anything more than zero errors in non-statistical, you often have to fail the control or radically increase your sample size. Okay, and of course we talked about this idea that population size, for the most part, does not influence sample size for test of controls. But if you look at the advanced module in the chapter, you'll see there's this little formula, which is this correction factor, which if you're using a smaller population, will reduce your sample size to account for the smaller population. And these are just suggested sample sizes for smaller population sizes. So if you were to use the finite correction factor, and apply it to the sample sizes you get from the tables, you would get these 
sample sizes. For this advanced module, you don't need to know anything more than what is on this slide and what I just said. Okay, you don't need to memorize the formula for the correction factor.